All right, so Jared, if you would mind, bring up the uh, bring up the kingdoms. So the eight kingdoms be obviously just in a way of review. Uh, the kingdom of God. So, Cole, do I sound any different when I can I speak and sound healthy? A little different. Okay, that's good. And uh, so, first, you know, kingdom of God is everything under the sovereignty of God. Um, God is so sovereign that we still have a free will, but yet he still accomplishes his will through our free will. Um, It's still, you know, we have a free will. We have a choice. God has given us a choice in every aspect, salvation, and all sorts of other neat stuff. But the kingdom of God, everything falls under the kingdom of God. Now, it does not mean that the kingdom of God is necessarily in charge at that moment. It is... Okay, well, let's keep on going here. So Satan's kingdom, actually Satan's kingdom should be number three. So let's go with the kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven is everything inside of the atmosphere. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So the kingdom of heaven is the atmosphere and earth. And so when, uh, when, when Jesus talks about when Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven, uh, it's different than the kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are not the same thing. <coughs> kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God is everything spiritual. Uh, it's physical. It's all these different things. It's righteousness. It's you know, kingdom of heaven is only physical. And so then Satan's kingdom. So at creation, it would have been Adam as the king, kingdom of heaven. But Satan uh, tempted him, and uh, so Adam and Eve then fell. And so we then became Satan's kingdom. And remember, that's proved all over Scripture. Even G- you know, Satan came to Jesus and said, Hey, if you would be- kneel before me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the world in the moment of time. And Jesus did not argue the point, but said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, remember, it's still the kingdom of heaven because it's still kingdom of heaven however it falls under satan's kingdom but yet still falls under you know the kingdom of god we get this so you know it you know it's a lot of moving parts there but not really then we have the gentile kingdom starting with genesis chapter 10 and uh you know then you have nimrod you have all these other different people um trying to establish the kingdom of heaven under one person and one government that has been the goal since day one by Satan. God has at every turn done something to v- divine to stop it from happening. Uh, so remember, they went to build the Tower of Babel. And we're going to build this up to, up to heaven. And God says, hey, let's go and see what they're doing. And said, no, if, if they build this too tall, if they, if they get too powerful, it's going to be one world government. And we don't want that. Let's confound their language confounded their language and spread them out. And so the Gentile kingdoms, we fall under a Gentile kingdom. We fall under a Gentile kingdom, under the kingdom of heaven, under Satan's kingdom, under the kingdom of God. <clears throat> then we get to Abraham, and probably uh, wherever you want to now call the nation of Israel, the nation of Israel, uh, could be at Abraham, should, could be at the crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, but So then you have the kingdom of Israel, which is still alive and kicking. Um, it, it was divided. It was moved. It was assimilated into other places. But when we talk about the Bible, like when we talk about the kingdoms today, the kingdom of heaven, when the Bible refers to these things, it refers to them in a Israel-centric way. You know, when it talks about the kingdoms of this world, and when we talk about the, uh, the image that's right in front of you, that has to do with Nebuchadnezzar, the Greeks, the Romans. You know, how come when we talk about the Bible, you know, the Bible doesn't talk about Genghis Khan? Oh, well, Genghis Khan had no, no bearing over Israel whatsoever. Why does the Bible not talk about China? Oh, well, it's on the other side of the continent. No bearing whatsoever. And so, uh, you know, so remember those things when uh, we get to the kingdom of Israel. So then the Antichrist kingdom... <clears throat> that is during the tribulation. Now remember, uh, we sometimes get made fun of because we call others a, a new group of people making fun of us. 
uh, the, because we call the whole seven years of the tribulation the great tribulation. The, first, the, the, the tribulation is 1,260 days times two, times, time, and half a time, three and a half, right? And so it's also 40 and two months, but then times two. It's only the second half that's the great tribulation. The first half of the tribulation is going to be a very peaceful time. It's going to be a time where the Antichrist is gathering to have all of the kingdom of heaven under his control. He's going to make, uh, there's going to be so much peace on earth that, uh, I didn't put that slide in there. Um, The Bible talks about, you know, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. And so what we do is anytime something pops up, we start thinking, ooh, wars. It, it's been on, you know, and yes, I've been, it's been nice. It, the Lord pushed a couple reset buttons for me in the last couple weeks. And uh, one of them is just hardly ever on, you know, any social media or whatever. Uh, but, you know, you pop up occasionally, look, see what people are saying. And, uh, you know, as we're trying to fly out of Afghanistan, the people are posting up, well, now you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars. It's been a war for 20 years. You know, this, th- this is crazy. It's for, you know, wars and rumors of wars. There's always been a war. There's always been a rumor of war. However, in the three and a half years of the tribulation, the first three and a half years, uh, remember, it's going to be so peaceful that there is going to be a temple, a Jewish temple built on a, uh, on a, 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 a Islam mosques, no, 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 mosque necessarily, unless they're going to wipe the mosque off, but I kind of doubt that. Uh, but but on, on the same mound, possibly, as where the mosque is. The temple does not have to be built before Christ returns. The temple has to be built before the three and a half year mark. And so, you know, there's going to be such peace. It, the Antichrist is, and again, we're going off memory for some of this stuff. I could go back and show you, you know, the, the Antichrist is going to start out as the little horn. He's going to be a little slightly insignificant. He's not going to have regard for women. He's going to boast great things, no dark sentences. And so he is going to, at some point, bring nations together, possibly from a smaller nation. I don't know that for sure. And so then what's going to happen is, is, and we're going to get to these kingdoms, and, the, and I'll just show you this, is the Antichrist is going to bring the world together. He's going to confirm the covenant that's already established. You know, he doesn't, the, all the covenants that we need for Israel are in place. Uh, you know, you're, you can think all the way back. Remember Bill Clinton shaking hands with Yasser Arafat, and uh, who was the Israel prime minister at the time? I can't remember. I think that was before Netanyahu. And, uh, and there's been all these accords. There's been all these peace trees. Been, but now the Antichrist is going to come in and confirm them. The Bible doesn't say the Antichrist comes in and signs them. He's going to confirm them. And so when that happens, so there's going to be such peace that now wars and rumors of wars matters. Because now you're starting to get towards three and a half year point. You have the part where, G, where Satan himself will enter end into the Antichrist at day 1,260. Uh, but when that happens, and he stands and proclaims himself as God in the temple, remember Jesus said, flee. When you see the abomination of desolation, Sam, where ought not, that Daniel spoke of, run. Because that means, and it's still going to be one, another 1,260 days, but there's going to be oppression. Israel's going to be overrun. And, uh, and, when that ha- and also, not to mention, when the, the second coming, when Christ comes back and speaks, Armageddon is not a nuclear war. Armageddon won't be at Armageddon, by the way. Remember, they're gathering at Armageddon to come down, and the armies will surround Jerusalem. So many people, remember the arm, no, I'm sorry, the river of the east has to be dried up, Euphrates, for the armies of the east to come across. There's going to be so many people here that Jesus is going to speak, it's going to be done, and the blood will flow for two, almost 200 miles to the horse's bridle because all those people did not flee like they were told to. Armageddon is not a nuclear war. Um, It is Jesus coming back, speaking, and it being over. The earthquake from his return will be so great that Jerusalem will be split. He'll stand on it. And uh, anyways, that's Antichrist's kingdom, which then gives way to Christ's kingdom. Yes? What happens to some of the people that aren't there during Armageddon? Back, speak. What happens to the people that aren't right there with all the armies that aren't 
When Jesus speaks, it's a geographic location that dies. Everybody in this spot. They live. They live. And so remember those end up being the people, the sheep and goat nations from Matthew okay. 25. Okay. They, get, they get to walk alive into the millennium if they have the Messiah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 They get to walk alive into the millennium if they have taken care of Israel. If they rejected Israel, then they're a goat nation and they'll die. They'll go to hell, not because they didn't take not because they didn't take care of Israel, but because they're not saved. Nobody on the planet, when Christ returns, is going to be saved. There's going to be another, you know, there isn't just the rapture. There's, you know, the gleanings, there's the uh, you know, there's going to be the two witnesses. There's going to be, you know, people going up right at the end. And that's where some people get confusion on timing of the rapture. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. And so Antichrist kingdom becomes Christ's kingdom. There's a time of cleansing. There's a time, you know, the Bible even talks about it. I think it's in, uh, uh, is it in uh, Ezekiel? Where they're going to be walking around with flags uh, to clean up the bone fragments and the, all the, you know, from... From that time, I think it's 75 days. But the Antichrist kingdom, Christ's kingdom, which then becomes the millennium, Jesus will establish then the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven will finally be under one throne, David's throne, and under one man, Jesus Christ. It'll be the first time in history, outside of maybe Adam, where all dominion falls under one person, one man, and it will be a holy kingdom, it'll be a great kingdom, and Christ will rule with, uh, with an iron fist. And uh, so that's Christ's kingdom. And then towards the end of Christ's kingdom, remember, you know, Satan will be uh, loosed. It will be the battle of Gog and Magog towards the end. And then it's going to be over quickly again. And then Christ submits his kingdom. Then it all becomes the Father's kingdom. I forgot to mention, Revelation 19 talks about how uh, the kingdoms of, our, uh, of this world have become the kingdoms of our, of, of our Lord and of his Christ. And uh, so, you know, that's Handel's Messiah, but it's also from the Bible. And so those kingdoms, and then Christ then um, submits his, you know, kingdom to the Father's kingdom. And that's the everlasting kingdom that is now back to the kingdom of God. Everything, uh, and, you know, sin, Satan, all that is done with. And uh, going forward, righteousness forever, heaven, new heaven, new earth. Um, there we go. Any questions? <clears throat> okay. So, if you'll go to the Gentiles and Prophecy, please, which is also the sheet that you have in your hand here. <clears throat> so, let's go to Daniel chapter 2. I think you're already there. Nebuchadnezzar came pretty close to controlling all of the kingdom of heaven. Um, matter of fact, with the wording from Daniel chapter 2, it almost sounds like he did, but there are other kingdoms at the time, and I think what the language is trying to do is the language is talking about, like I said, an Israel-centric language. Um, so, by the time Nebuchadnezzar steps up, <coughs> Israel has already been a nation. Um, they've already been split into the northern kingdom and southern kingdom. And so now, well, the northern kingdom is carried away uh, into Assyria, assimilated, and uh, never to really return up until now the last 50, 60 years. And uh, so the southern kingdom, which would be the lineage of David, Solomon, and uh, so those kings after that, and then all the way down to Jehoiachin would be the last Sovereign Judah King. And so remember that bloodline though continues all the way down to Joseph and Jesus. And so from Matthew chapter 1, the people in Israel knew that Jesus was the rightful King of Israel. They knew this. That, o thou son of David. They knew it. So, but backing up to the Babylonian captivity, and so they were carried away. Daniel was one of those that was carried away. Made a eunuch on the way which means, um, well, made a eunuch, uh, cut some parts off and uh, uh, whatever. And uh, so, but Daniel's a eunuch. Uh, he sticks with the three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. 
and uh, probably, carried, probably carried away as a young man or teenager, and then spends three years in training. So now what we're going to look at is Nebuchadnezzar's dream from Daniel chapter 2. I'm not going to tie it in as much as this looks like. Uh, we're going to read Nebu- uh, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 2, but right next to it is Daniel chapter 7. And you can go read, the, read that yourself. Do that this week. Uh, we're going to talk about the kingdom that prophesies, the main person, and then over there on the other, on the right, we'll talk about that briefly. But so Daniel here, I'm sorry, Nebuchadnezzar gets a dream, and then Daniel is called to interpret. We'll keep this up here. We will not read the entire chapter. We'll skip around a little bit. We'll start here in verse 1. Down chapter 2. And verse 1. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. So this is a vivid dream. Uh, Daniel, or I'm sorry, Nebuchadnezzar is a fairly new king. Uh, Daniel's in the middle of his training period. Uh, it says here in verse 2, Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams so that they came and stood before the king. Now remember when it says back there to call the magicians... Daniel ends up being in charge of the magicians, and these magicians ends up being the magi, the wise men, that come to the birth of Christ. A little late. I was one of my favorite moments. You know, back in the middle Midwest, there is a grocery chain called Aldi's, and uh, Brandon knows all about them. And uh, Aldi's has very cheap food, but it's, it's erratic. You never know exactly what you're going to get. And you have to pay a quarter to get a, get, get your cart. And you pay a quarter, you unchain, right? So, okay. And, uh, but we're sitting outside of Aldi. Lisa's going into Aldi's. And uh, there, you know, there was this fortune teller house right next to it on Highway 30. And as I'm sitting there, Lisa's in Aldi. This woman comes out of the fortune teller house, goes up, looks inside the mailbox, opens the mailbox, Nothing's there, and goes back in. <coughs> I'll give you a second. People go by and pay this person all the time money to tell them stuff about their lives, but yet you can't even know if there's mail. Yeah, you want to talk about creepy? Pastor Matt's at you know wherever he's at right now, Provo, and uh, but uh, he knows what mail I'm getting on his phone because he's having his mail forwarded that was coming to his house for a while. He knows when, he's like, hey, when are you going to give me that, uh, give me that Verizon bill? Okay, okay. And uh, so, yeah. Uh, but anyways, it's been, uh, it's been fun. Um, but, uh, you know, these, these psychics and things. By the way, let me also back up and say this. Don't goof with psychics. It's not because it's not real. If I was you, I would never even have considered having a Ouija board or something like that in my house. Not because it's junk, because you shouldn't goof that stuff. should ever goof that stuff. Um, you know, you think about uh, Samuel. You know, he was called up from the dead. And it, the, the Bible says that it was Samuel. And it was the witch of Endor. And, uh, you know, don't, don't goof that stuff. Don't go to, you know, these people, you know, and they're rubbing stuff together, looking at crystals, you know, balls and trying to tell you stuff. <clears throat> Remember, that's what killed Saul. Like, you know, hey, you did this. So, Anyways. Okay, so a little note here. Let's go down to verse 4. From verse 4 to the end of this chapter 7 in Daniel from here is written in Chaldean. So if you have a strong concordance and it says Greek, Hebrew, and the Chaldean, it's from this verse 4 right here all the way to the end of chapter 7 is in Chaldean. Uh, verse 4. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king in Syriac, O king, live forever. Tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said unto the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream uh, with the interpretation thereof, watch this, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your house shall be made a dunghill. You know, Nebuchadnezzar had an MO. He had a way he did things. If you don't get this done, I'm going to cut you in pieces. I'm going to feed you to your dogs, and you're going to be a dunghill. And which changes by the end of Daniel. Um, so, verse 11, and they're trying to make excuses. This is a weird thing. 
uh, that the king requireth, and there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause was the king angry and very furious, and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And uh, then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. I'm sorry, that uh, verse 19. Night vision, when uh, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Uh, interesting thing here, verse 20. <coughs> no, actually, it gets interesting in 24. Well, actually, it's all interesting. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings, and giveth wisdom unto the wise, and knowledge to them that know understanding. Notice, by the way, he gives wisdom unto the wise. Doesn't say, would it be, you know, we think, you know, let's give wisdom to the fools. And here, you know, it says he gives wisdom to the wise. Now look at verse 24. Therefore Daniel went unto Arioch, whom the king had uh, ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me before the king, and I will show unto the king the interpretation. So you've been commanded to kill all the wise men, and all of a sudden now one comes in and says, Hey, don't kill anybody. I'll go talk to them. What do you do if you're Ariok? Sorry, Daniel. Right? I've already been commanded. If I now bring you in, it makes me look stupid. You know, I'm now all of a sudden going to be part of this dunghill. But look at verse 25. You want to talk about trust. Then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. That, look down verse 28. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets. Um, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon the, your uh, bed are these. Uh, verse 31. Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Now, when you look at your sheet in front of you, or look at this picture, generally that's it. It's kind of accepted that that's what the image looked like, but you know, who knows? Uh, but you know, that's if you go search Daniel's image, that's what you're going to get. Um, verse thirty-two: The image's head was of fine gold; his breast and his arms of silver; his belt, uh, belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet uh, part of iron and part of clay. Uh, thou, thou sawest tell a stone, that, I'm sorry, thou sawest tell that a stone was cut out without hands. So who's the stone cut, cut without hands? It's Christ, it's Jesus. Jesus establishing, verse 34, his eternal kingdom, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. So this image that is being seen, gold, uh, silver, brass, clay, iron and clay mixed together. And uh, so what you're seeing here is remember all of these kingdoms are the kingdoms that interact with Israel. Nebuchadnezzar is the king that carries them away. The Medes and Persians are the ones that send them back. The Greeks, remember it was Alexander the Great. We talked about that, uh, Daniel chapter 11, two weeks ago, I think, whenever we talked about that. And we talked about the split into the four kingdoms. And then uh, we really didn't get into the Roman kingdom, but then the Roman kingdom ends up being, there the uh, legs of iron ends up getting split into two, which is prophetic in itself because there ends up being an eastern kingdom and a western kingdom. And uh, so just amazing stuff here going backwards. So let's keep on reading here. Where are we at? 35, yes. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, and the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. In other words, it just became dust. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Talking about Christ in the millennium. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation there before the king. Thou, O king, art king of kings, for the God of heaven have given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And, um, and uh, wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air, fowls of heaven have given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. So, again, that's where it sounds like kingdom of heaven, Nebuchadnezzar had it. Um, I don't think that's what it means, but it could be. So now backing up and looking then at the head, that is Nebuchadnezzar. 
Uh, the head of gold, which is also in Daniel chapter 7, uh, the lion, and in Revelation 13, uh, gets into that uh, when the kingdom ends up being destroyed. So that's the first one. The head of gold, the Babylonian Empire, the dates and times are right there before you. Um, Okay, verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. This would be the Medes and Persians. Remember, the Medes and Persians was a bigger kingdom. It went a little further east. Uh, It maintained the west. But remember, the Medes and Persians, even though being inferior, was a bloodless coup. Daniel ends up being carried away by the uh, Babylonians. And the, the Medes and Persians, remember, they blocked the river and then come in the back way and take over, don't kill anybody, and then the Medes and Persians take over from the Babylonians that way, end up moving the castle to Sushan the palace, and then that's where we get the story of Esther. And so, I mean, this all ties together. So it says there that it's inferior to thee. And then another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. That's talking about uh, Alexander the Great. It's talking about the uh, Greeks. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron break, that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And so, you know, the, the Romans just going to overrun everything they can. Now watch this in verse 41. And whereas thou sawest, so we, we just saw an image. Daniel, or Nebuchadnezzar didn't say anything about the toes, but now Daniel's going to talk about the toes. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of the potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, and they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. So now we put, put back over here. So we have the Babylonian Empire, the Medes and Persians, we have the Greeks, and then we have the Roman Empire ending about 476 AD. And so with that, you have the Jews intermixed into these different kingdoms. But now when it says prophetic gap, the interesting thing there becomes is Daniel's 70th week. So we have the the split of the kingdom. We have a right leg. We have a left leg. We have the Byzantine Empire. We have the Roman Empire. And so what's going to happen then is now the feet are still going to be an offshoot. So if you ever hear somebody talk about the revived Roman Empire, that's what it's talking about. Now, it does not mean that the Antichrist has to come from the revived Roman Empire. The revived Roman Empire is a religious institution. And you read Revelation chapter 17, the Antichrist rides the leopard, rides the religious institution. The the Antichrist comes into power partially from religion. Now, he's going to be the little horn. He's going to rise to power, and there's going to be ten kingdoms. And remember, there's ten, and then there ends up being the three. They hand their power over. He ends up being the one that's left. This is all in Revelation. We've talked about that. And so what's going to happen then, you know, the Antichrist is going to be, at some point, you have an affliction to death, and the, uh, I'm sorry, the beast. Okay, i got to get this back straight. The false prophet, I'm sorry, so there we go. Remember, sometimes I say this wrong. There's a holy trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's also an unholy trinity, Satan, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. And so at some point, the false prophet will raise the Antichrist from the dead. Remember, it says he's got a wound unto death, and he's going to be healed. And so, you know, during the, during the tribulation, people are going to see this and they're, they're going to be amazed. Oh, I, I, I remember somebody being raised from the dead. Yeah, the Antichrist will be. And the, the strong delusion, I'm going to talk about this a little bit Sunday morning. But, you know, the strong delusion that they might believe a lie that's going to be happening during the tribulation. Does anybody kind of sense that something like that's going on right now? 
Like there's just, you can't find truth to save your life right now. And uh, you, know, you, you don't know what is truth. You don't know what information to trust. And you know, when I was growing up, I don't remember anything like that. And, uh, but you know, so the strong delusion that they might believe a lie. And I, I, I think that spirit's already at work. But, so we get over here, the feet and iron of clay down there. And you see the ten horns, revived Roman Empire, the Antichrist. But then you see finally... And, and by the way, if you go read Revelation 17, uh, 3 through 4, 20, all that, it talks about uh, the different kingdoms, the different crowns. And we could follow those ten horns all the way back to Daniel too. Uh, Daniel as well. Uh, so then finally, this is, this image is the image of the worldly empires, the Gentile empires that have been used in order to bring humanity under submission under one government. Now, it doesn't mean other people haven't. Uh, you know, obviously Hitler tried. Obviously other people tried. But, you know, they're, you know they're, they don't fit in the prof- prophetic gap here for this. So, all of a sudden, the Antichrist is going to succeed. And he's going to have all the kingdoms subdued. And it's going to be a very short-lived kingdom. But they're going to give him his power. He's going to stand at the temple, proclaim himself as God. And so then the armies of the world are then gathered. And, uh, and I'm not sure if they turn on him at that point or if they're still fighting for him. I, I, I have a little bit of confusion there. Other people seem to have that a little bit more straight than I do. Uh, but I, I, I still don't have it completely straight as to whose sides at the very end, whose sides on who. They all die together anyways because uh, they're in the wrong spot. And uh, so when that happens, Jesus comes back, establishes his kingdom, and then the millennium will then last a thousand years. Christ will rule and reign on earth, and it will be this image that's destroyed, this government system that's destroyed, that the Antichrist, that Satan has been using this whole time to try to bring everybody under one system. You hear people talk about you know, one, one world currency, and one world government. You know, it's nothing to be scared of. Um, you know, if it did happen, you know, we'd go about our day, but uh, at the same time, it can't happen until a certain point. But even if it did happen, it just means we're about out of here. Scared of that? I'm not. And uh, so this stone that is cut out without hands ends up being Jesus establishing the millennium and then obviously the Father's kingdom, and everything's tied back together once again at the end. Well, it ended up being shorter than I thought it would. Any questions on the Bible study? You you might as well ask. We're like 10, 15 minutes early. How's that possible? Jared? Can you do me a favor? Go back to that slide. Now go to the next one. Well, here's Clarence Larkin uh, talking about the image. Iron and clay. You see the split. You see the tribulation. See how he fits it in there. And then you see how the beasts at the bottom. 